Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Elizabeth Bradley. I'm going to be doing a portion of tonight's program. I'm going to be talking about exercise. And this is Allie Porter, who is going to do the other portion, which talks about nutrition. Um, the third member of our team, Deb Ragosta, is not here yet, but she will be here. She's actually in a meeting. I think she's getting an award tonight, so when she comes in, we should give her a big hand. But she'll be here shortly, and she'll be the one with the tickets for the raffle at the end. Okay, so make sure you stay for that. That's I think I think they're giving away two two prizes. Um, in addition. There are flyers out on the front table. If you got here early and didn't pick one up, make sure you get one. There are two local gyms, Midtown, here in Milford, that are offering good, a good special for you, just for you guys. And um, the other one is the Whiten Community Center in Whitensville. Has a couple good deals, too. So um, I guess first, this is all kind of new to me. I, I, um, I've never actually competed against the Bruins, but um, <laughs> see how it goes. Um, my, um, I actually started, I made a big career change about 15 years ago. Oh, did it disappear? Good. <laughs> um, 15 years ago, I, I um, was starting, I was playing tennis quite a bit, and I actually had started playing tennis when I was 35, and I started wondering why on earth are these people that play so much tennis just not looking fit. I expected them all to look like Maria Sharapova or Serena Williams, but they just were not looking fit to me. They were all overweight, and I just started studying it a little bit more, and I finished up my degree at Northeastern in clinical exercise physiology. So tonight's lecture, I kind of want to focus towards the clinical aspect of exercise. Um, you may be a little upset to hear this, but what I'm going to say is you don't exercise to lose weight. I really believe that. Now, you can get up and leave if you want, but where you really lose weight is right here. She'll tell us all about diet. So first of all, we're trying to kind of smooth over the word exercise, and I'd really rather use the word activity than exercise. It, exercise seems to have negative connotations to people, like, oh, I have to go to the gym, I have to do this, I have to do that. Really, all you have to do is stay active. That's it. Um, going back, let's see, which way do I go? This way, probably, right? OK. Kind of a bad rap for McDonald's, I know. But um, if you go back thousands of years and think about what our genome was, you had the sedentary people that were basically going to sit there and not get fed, and they were going to get taken by, by predators. Or you had the people that moved, or the genomes that moved around. They were able to hunt. They were able to fish. They were able to take care of themselves. Those, that's the genome that, that we're from. That's the genome that progressed to who we are today. We were made to move. We were designed to be active. Now. I told you not to exercise to lose weight, so why do we exercise? Well, the American College of Sports Medicine, which is the governing body for exercise physiologists, has come up with several reasons. Th these are very, very conservative right now, but they've discovered that if you don't exercise, you get depressed, you're more, more likely to get sick with cancer, heart disease, hypertension, um, and diabetes. So how does all this activity work? <coughs> the main thing that activity does is it affects the endocrine system. It affects hormones in our body and to signaling different things to happen. Now this, the tough part is what we're programmed to see is if we exercise, we'll lose weight. So we're programmed to exercise, get on a scale, and then if we didn't lose weight, what happens? We get depressed <laughs> and, and we can't, we stop exercising. But what in fact is happening is under, we can't see what's happening. We can see, for instance, insulin. Insulin becomes so much more sensitive when you exercise. There are studies out there. In fact, there's one study I just read recently about uh, healthy young men. They were in their 20s and 30s and they were asked to um, actually do no weight-bearing exercises, essentially just stay in bed all day, which is probably a dream for a young man, but 
no exercise at all. Within 24 hours, their insulin sensitivity had decreased. Um, it's actually, it was down 30, it was 40% less effective in just 24 hours. The other thing that happens, blood pressure. Think about blood pressure. What's, when you're in high school, remember how, what affects high, what affects pressures? It's volume of a fluid, viscosity of a fluid, or the diameter of the vessel that you're, you have the fluid in, those three things. Well, what exercise does is it, it releases a hormone called an endothelium relaxing factor, which dilates the blood vessels in your body. Bigger the vessel, the lower the blood pressure. That's another thing you can't see. It's all happening with activity. Another thing that happens is, is it increases your HDL. Everyone knows that HDL is the good cholesterol, right? That's the cholesterol that's going to be taking the, the uh, fats out of your system. And exercise increases HDL. So you, therefore, the viscosity of your blood is going to go down also. If the viscosity goes down, blood pressure goes down. Does anybody know a gentleman by the name of Michael Mosley? Ever heard of him? Have you ever seen him on TV? He is a riot. He is like my hero right now. I just, I could watch anything that he does. He's so funny. Uh, a couple of, he, he got into exercise because his, uh, his doctor told him he had to lose weight. He's actually a, a trained, I think he's a psychiatrist. He went to medical school anyhow, but he became a BBC journalist. I, apparently that pays better than medicine in the UK, I don't know, maybe it's nationalized medicine, I don't know what it is, but he's definitely a quirky kind of guy. He does, he's actually on your list of resources to, um, I think it's the Horizon series that shows a lot about exercise and weight loss. There is also, he does also programs that, that show surgeries, he put little cameras and watch a bariatric surgery going on, things like that. They're very interesting, they're humorous shows to watch, and they're on PBS quite often. But a couple of his experiments are, are kind of fun to talk about. Uh, one of them, that uh, these are also other, other shows that he has done, but um, one of his experiments is he took, he went out and had a giant UK British breakfast with sausages and bacon and eggs and buttered toast and he went into the lab and he, he had his a vial of blood drawn put in a centrifuge and the and the fat came up to the top of the centrifuge the next day he went out he had the same breakfast fat 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 went for a 45 minute walk came back into the lab blood went through the centrifuge it had 30 percent less fat on the top of it and that was just by doing that one walk. So it's the only thing he changed. Um, re actually, remember this fast exercise too. It'll come up later on in the, in the um, slideshow. So I, of course, go to my doctor a few years ago. And my doctor says, yeah, your diastolic blood pressure is 90. You're going to have to go on medicine. I'm like, I, give me another year, give me a year. So I happen to be fortunate enough to live in a neighborhood where there is lots of sidewalks and lots of friends. We got out there every morning and we walked before work for 45 minutes. We did it for a year, which is kind of a long time. We did it in the snow, it's, it was you know, dark. We, did it. we were very, very, very good about doing it. I came in for my next annual exam. My diastolic blood pressure had gone from 90 to 72. And that's all I did, that's all I changed. I didn't change my diet at all. It's, this stuff it really works. Now the flip side of that, in preparation for this lecture, I decided ah, I'm gonna stop the walking, but I'm gonna join Weight Watchers, and I'm gonna see what happens. So for six weeks, I was on the Weight Watchers, and sure enough, I lost a pound a week. It, that program works, it's phenomenal. I go to check my blood pressure, it's back up to 82. and went from 72 to 82, just because I stopped doing my walking. It's things you can't see uh, that are so important to, to, um, to your body. Um, another one of his experiments that we'll talk about briefly is, whoops, we don't have enough fat yet. Um, this happens to be a picture of him down in the corner there. This is what's called a VO2 max test. It's, uh, if anybody <coughs> asks you if you want to volunteer to take one of these tests, think twice about it. It's pretty grueling. You're sitting on a bike, you're going as hard and as fast as you can. 
you're sweating, you have this thing in your mouth you cannot swallow, so you end up with drool and sweat all over your body. And what does he find out after this? What, what they do is they capture the exhaled gases, and by looking at the exhaled gases, they can tell what fuel you're burning. Essentially, we do make fuel ourselves internally, but it's a, uh, most of our, the fuel that we need comes from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and that's not my area either. So um, but what he found out after this test was that he was born, bur burning carbohydrates. And he was so upset because he said, look it, I came to you because my doctor says I'm too fat. I get on this bike, I exercise, how come I'm not burning fat? Well, what happens is your body loves carbohydrates. That's the first fuel it'll go after. It'll take carbohydrates all day long, as long as you keep giving it carbohydrates. But if we run out of carbohydrates, uh, I shouldn't tell you the next part. If we have too many carbohydrates and not enough activity, those carbohydrates turn into fat. It's stored as fat because the body says, hey, we're going to need these later. Let's store them. Well, what happened the next day, he was kind of disappointed, but he came in the next day to the lab. He hadn't even gotten on the bike yet. They put the mask on him. He's just resting and he's breathing. And lo and behold, what's he burning? He's burning fat. He didn't even exercise and he's burning fat. So what happened overnight? He basically ran out of carbohydrates and his body had to then st start eating, taking away the, the um, using the fat for energy. So these things, these things, another thing, these are, these are happening without us even knowing it. Um, the, I, so in, in, I guess in general, we should just remember to try to balance your carbohydrate intake with your exercise <coughs> intake if you can. But briefly with fat, I mean, not all fat is bad. There are, <laughs> poor kid. There are essentially two, two types of fat now. We're separating it into subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. Now, doctor, f subcutaneous fat is this stuff right here that we have on our belly and our butts and our hips. Visceral fat really you can only see in MRIs. It's the fat that surrounds the organs. Doctors now believe that that type of fat is actually more dangerous to our health than the subcutaneous fat. They're, they're feeling that that's the fat that gets into our bloodstream easier. Unfortunately, there isn't a way to say, okay, I'm going to exercise, but I only want to burn my visceral fat. I don't want to burn my subcutaneous fat. You still have to do the same routine, and it, it'll burn both of them. <clears throat> uh, so let's talk about activity. Now, this used to be the food pyramid, <laughs> but we stole it from the dietitians and nutritionists because we thought it was good for exercise. What you'll see at the very top is what we call screen time. Screen time is what doctors find is the biggest killer for us. The longer you're, you're watching TV or on your computer, the bigger the problem is. So that's why that's at the top, and you're trying to reduce that as much as possible. The next section down is strengthening and stretching. Those are two, we're going to talk about, actually we split up exercise into four groups, and two of them is stretching and strengthening. The next one down is cardio, that's our third group. And the fourth group is at the base of the pyramid, the one you want to do the most, and that's activities of daily living, just what we call lifestyle activities. It's everything else you do. It's like 90% of your day is down there in the bottom of the pyramid. Um, when we talk about what type of exercise to do, right now, we really, it's kind of generic for everybody, but scientists are getting much closer to being able to determine what exercise is right for each individual person through DNA testing. It's not here yet, but believe me, your grandchildren will be able to, to reap the benefit from that kind of um, research and science. This chair is way up front if you want. <laughs> okay, so we're first gonna, we're going to talk about cardio. <clears throat> uh, there's some examples of cardio over there on the left. Everybody aware of cardio? We're, what we're working is we're stressing the heart muscle. Now. When we talk about exercise, we talk about th 
three things. We talk about how hard we exercise. That's called the intensity. We talk about the duration, how long we have to exercise, and fre frequency, how often we have to exercise. Well, in, as far as cardio, the intensity is, is calculated off of your maximum heart rate. Now, based on evidence, scientists have determined that each individual can come up with their maximum heart rate, heart rate just with a simple calculation is 220 minus your age. And that's what they consider your maximum heart rate. Now, in order to get a good cardio workout, you have to get your heart rate up to 55 to 85 percent of your maximum heart rate. It's pretty hard to be running on a treadmill and checking your pulse at the same time. Now, a lot of treadmills have heart rate monitors on them, and you'll see this in a gym also. Um, it's, this is a chart that's a 10-second count, so if you have time to at least count for 10 seconds, for instance, like say we're talking about a 50-year-old man, say his, his maximum heart rate would be 170, that's 220 minus 50, and his target heart rate 55 to 85 percent would be between 94 and 144 beats per minute. If he does a 10 second count, he's right here at 50, and he gets 17 beats in 10 seconds, he's working at 60 percent of his maximum heart rate. Is he in the cardio zone? Yes, he is. He's working out perfectly. The only diff the difficult part is when you get up to 85 percent of your max, it's very, very, very hard to maintain that for any length of time. You're going to get exhausted. So you have to drop it down a little bit. The other thing that happens, this is on a sidebar, is your body burns different types of fuel at the 55% range than, than at the 85% range. But the, honestly, we're working at just trying to get a good heart, good cardio workout. So just think of that, those numbers there. Um, also, when you're out with your friends walking and you don't want to take your pulse, a lot of scientists believe in the singing rule. If you can sing while you're exercising, you're not working hard enough. You have to increase your intensity. Now, I don't know how you do that when you're swimming. That's one thing I haven't figured out, but you're a genius if you can sing while you swim. So that's intensity. Dur duration, um, we have to do 30 minutes a day. That sounds pretty grueling, if you ask me. How many of us can put out 30 minutes of our day and do cardio? Well, the good news is they now say, <laughs> some people can, and that's awesome. They now say we only have to do 10-minute bouts. We can do 10 minutes of cardio three times a day. You can get up in the morning, do 10 minutes, do 10 minutes at lunch, your lunch break, and 10 minutes at night, and you're getting your 30 minutes in. It's perfect. Uh, let's go move on to the next part of our... Um, the next part of the pyramid, which is strengthening our skeletal muscles. Some examples on the left, strengthening skeletal muscles. Very similar to the heart. You need to stress the muscle in order to strengthen it. You can do that in a gym, or you can do that with body weight exercises at home, or you can do that in a, with a combination. But in any case, to stress the muscle, the skeletal muscle, you have to do PRE, progressive resistance training. And that is essentially lifting, increasing the weight after so many repetitions. What a normal progression, what we use down the street at the rehab site is when you can do two sets, say you pick up an eight pound dumbbell and you're doing bicep curls, you, when you can do two sets of 10, then you move on to doing two sets of 12 the next time you exercise that body part. The third time, two sets of 15, when you're at two sets of 15 comfortably, then you know you have to increase the weight the next time you go into the gym. Does that make sense to everybody? That's progressive resistance training. But how does a skeletal muscle get, get, actually get stronger? Well, the first way and the most, the most immediate and, and actually probably the, really all you'll need to get is a neural recruitment. So what happens for the muscles to get stronger is we send signals from our brain to those muscles. And you send more nerves to those muscles, and that, that muscle gets stronger just by that one fact. The second way is in the second picture, our muscles are fibers. They're pulled like this. And when you go and stress your muscle, you're actually breaking, making little tiny tears in that muscle fiber. 
And when you sleep at night and it gets repaired, that's how the muscle gets stronger. Uh, oftentimes, people will feel soreness the next day after they lift a lot of weight. That's called delayed onset muscle soreness, and that's actually a good thing. It means you actually have worked the muscle to the point where it's repairing itself to be a little bit stronger than it was. But when you're doing exercises, remember the first most important thing is to think about the muscle you're, you're actually exercising. Um, the soreness, yes, the soreness uh, can be relieved. Uh, we didn't, the, can be relieved by my favorite, number three, stretching. <clears throat> I should actually go back and talk about uh, a little bit more about strengthening. Um, there are certain goals to, I mean, if people ask, well, how strong do I have to be? There are certain goals for certain muscles for general health, but if you think about what kind of activity you do, do you sit all day? Do you um, play with your grandchildren all day? It's looking at your activity level, and you have to bring your fitness level up to that activity level. My, I always give this example of my brother-in-law. He was a package deliverer for a company that has a brown truck and for years, and he would complain all the time, I don't have to do any strengthening because I lift 60-pound packages all day long, but if I had a nickel for every time he complained of soreness. I would be really wealthy right now. He never, ever strengthened. He did not, he was not fit enough for that job. He's since retired, and now what does he do? He sits in front of the TV, and he does this, or he's on his computer, and he says to me, I must be in great shape because I have no aches and pains. It's perfect. Well, that was not really true this winter when he had to shovel his driveway, of, like, every week and complained of back pain. One, one area... Um, your back muscles, for instance, and actually most of your lower body muscles should be able to lift your body weight. So when you go to the gym and you go on a back extension machine, it's the erector spinae muscle right here, you should work up to a point where you're lifting your body weight. Okay, it's a, not an easy thing to do. You have to start way lower than that. But what, um, at the, when I was working at the spine center, that's what we told people. It's like if you can lift, you know, on, an a, a person, an average person, an athlete would lift m way more than that, but the, an average person would, should be able to lift 100 to 120 percent of their body weight. Um, okay, and lower body also, your quads, your um, hamstrings, they all should be about the same too. Um, frequency of, we talked about intensity, um, frequency of, of um, of uh, stre what am I strengthening your, your skeletal muscles? You want to try to do that three times a week. I think they say, oh, they do say three times a week. Okay, so you don't want to repeat the same muscle day in and day out. Every day you can't do bicep curls because you never they'll never get stronger. You have to give them a chance to repair. Um, one other little side benefit of muscle strengthening is that muscles are way more metabolically active than fat. The more muscle you have on your body, the more you're burning calories just sitting here. Two people sitting right next to each other, whoever has more muscle than fat on their body is going to be burning more calories just, just sitting here, not doing a thing. Um, but, okay, so we talked, about, we, we talked about the delayed onset muscle soreness from, from uh, lifting weights. One thing that can help relieve it is stretching. Now, stretching, my favorite. Stretching you want to do at least twice a day. Uh, we've got the little cat in there because if any of you have pets, they know for some reason that they have to stretch about 15 times a day because they're stretching constantly. And at the Spine Center, we used to tell people, well, stretch whenever your cat does. That you'll be fine. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy thing to do, though. In stretches, you have to hold your stretches for 30 seconds, and you have to remember to breathe. I'll tell you, the first 15 seconds of a stretch is going to be painful. You don't want to pull to the point where you're in excruciating pain, but you want to pull, pull to a point where you feel tension. 
Hold that for 15 seconds and then the pain starts to relieve. You can't give in to that. Hold it for 30 seconds and breathe and you'll be fine. One thing about stretching is you really have to multitask stretching. You have to find ways to do it. And a lot of these are right at your desk, just sitting there stretching at your desk. I mean, I, one thing I do in the morning when I tie my sneakers, I do what we call a long sit on the bed so you can actually ha stretch your hamstrings while you're tying your shoes. Just fit it in wherever you can. But the other thing is you can lie down on the floor in the morning do a series of six or seven stretches. In fact, I, this, at the Spine Center, we found so many people um, that came in with back pain. We gave them four or five stretches to do, and that's all it took to relieve their back pain. I'll be happy to share those stretches with you. I do them every day. They're the, they're the best things, and there's only four or five of them, so it's not bad. But, um, excuse me? Cold? Yeah, both. Like, are you saying before you work out? Yep, it, both, actually. And there's static stretches and, and um, static and dynamic stretches. But yeah, when I get up in the morning, I will stretch cold, yeah, yeah. Will you show us those stretches? I will, okay. First one is a hamstring stretch. Now, if I was on the floor, could everyone see me? <laughs> I'm gonna just do, okay. This is a hamstring stretch. This way, okay. Hold it 30 seconds. This is a piriformis stretch. You're gonna have to stand up. This is a hamstring stretch. This is a piriformis stretch. This is the second one. Do it both legs. Knee to chest, third one. Trunk rotation, fourth one. And I think that's it. One, two, three, four. Did I, just, did I miss one? One, two, three. Start with those. <laughs> No, the in, you don't want to do the internal one. No, no, yeah, yeah. Don't do the internal. You can't. How do, you can't even put your socks on anymore that way, can you? <laughs> but you got new hips. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else with stretching? Oh, so yes. If you're lying down doing your morning stretches, just think about the, our next topic, which is our lifestyle activities. Okay, that's what you do 90% of the day. There's some pictures here of walking the dog. It's vacuum cleaning, mowing the lawn, changing the oil in the car. Um, the best tool for measuring how well you're doing on lifestyle is with a pedometer. How many use pedometers now? Anybody? Okay, good. The goal is 10,000 steps a day. It's um, not easy to do it if you're in a desk job. Where I work up down the street, all of us we average 1,000 steps an hour. So if you're working a 10-hour day, we're getting our 10,000 steps in just at work. It's pretty rare to be able to do that. I don't know any other job that can, maybe waitresses might, but I don't know any other job that will do that. But you've got to figure 10,000 steps a day. Um, okay, how am I doing? Am I doing too long? Yes, she's saying I'm doing too long. Okay, she, she might have the baby while we're here. Okay, um, okay. I'm going to just, um, we have a BIA, calcula a BIA scale outside. If anybody wants to have their body composition checked, we'll do that afterwards. It takes only a couple minutes to do it. Some people have already. So I'm just going to go through some of these targets so they can take a look at, at what they've written down and see how they're doing. Um, uh, there's some more lifestyle activities. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. First is a uh, BMI charts everywhere but it's hard to read this but you d you want to be less than 25 your bmi less than 25 okay the scale out there will give it to you um and charts all over the internet will give it to you and probably your doctor knows it it's it used to be the old met life charts remember a long time ago met life charts well now it's all bmi and i bet your medical insurer knows your bmi too <laughs> just in case you don't um, okay, we taught, these things are, are just general. I'm sure everyone knows blood pressure. You're always, they're always measuring your blood pressure. Um, Waist-hip ratios now. For women, a normal range is under 0 0.80. For men, 0 0.90. If you can't do both the waist and the hip, waist is 35, less than 35 inches for a woman and less than 40 inches for a man. That's your goal. Those are targets, okay? 
Um, so the body composition BIA scale we have out there works by sending an electrical current through your body, a very light electrical current. There are wa other ways of, of calculating body composition. The first one is a underwater weighing test. That's actually the most efficient way to measure body composition. Skin folds, it's a little painful, but, and it takes time, but that also works. The body pod, bod pod down there, is, actually measures how much air you displace on the Earth. And this is, doesn't that look easy? That's the BIA scale that we have out there. Very easy to do, right? You guys that did it? OK. What was the easy. Uh, targets for those? The targets were, let's see, there we go. Subcutaneous fat, that's the fat that we have around our bellies. That's the goals are in there, so you have to look at uh, your age. Skeletal muscle, yep. Where would you go to get that, like a water thing? The guy, was sitting the guy with the water thing? You really want to do that, do you? <laughs> I bet UMass does it. Any Northeastern has them. Any of the schools that have ex -phys now, they have exercise labs that do it. What yeah. about that pod? <laughs> and that pod, that's, those are, are um, commercially built. So some schools may have them. I mean, and it's a lot easier. It's seven minutes in there. That's it. And it, um, it's actually pretty close to the same as the, the water displacement, too, in accuracy. Uh, muscle targets right here. Those of you that are going to go on the scale afterwards, these, these, there are sheets of paper out here that, out there that show these, um, these numbers. So you don't have to write them down if you don't want to. Um, and briefly, important part to know about calories is you need a huge amount of calories just to function, just for vital organs to operate. 60 to 70 percent of the calories you take in go to your lungs, to your heart, to your brain, to your digestive system. That is, you cannot possibly cut those down. Um, so those 60 to 70 percent we call resting energy requirements. The BIA um, scale also gives you that data for individuals too. You can calculate it. There's a nice long, uh, there's several, there are several um, calculations for it, but this is one from the, the American Council of Exercise uses this, this calculation right here, this equation. Uh, then 20 to 30 percent of your calorie intake goes to your activities, and 10 percent of your calorie intake you lose just in heat. Moving. Uh, no, maybe we should not do all these classes here. So when we talk about exercise and um, what to do, I actually work with a group of people that are contemplating bariatric surgery, and they will come in and we'll talk about who they are, what they like to do, whether they like competition, whether they like uh, just it, to exercise at home individually. And we try to formulate some kind of exercise prescription for them. Now, there are classes all over the place, uh, yoga, Pilates, Zumba, everybody know all of these things. Um, Bozu, CrossFit, the TRX. I had a, a person come in and started with the TRX. She was in bed for two days afterwards and has given up on all exercise. So I would not recommend starting with TRX. TRX was designed, was built by, designed by Navy SEALs. And it's what it does, it's body weight exercise, but with no base of support at all. So you're not standing on the ground, you're hanging in the air. and. Uh, Remember the Iron Cross and all that in the Olympics? It's, so that I would not recommend starting with. But yoga, any of these other ones uh, can be modified to your level. If you choose not to do um, exercise, class exercises or gym exercises, there's a lot of things you can do at home. Um, very popular, Leslie Sansone, the walking tapes, very, very popular. Uh, my favorite yoga is Rodney Yee. Then we have some other tools here. TheraBand, anybody use TheraBands? You get them in PT. If you go on the TheraBand website, look at their manual. Their manual is excellent for exercise options, excellent. They show great pictures. 
uh, tell you what part of the body they're working on, really good. Same with the BOZU. BOZU is an acronym that stands for both sides up. So you, use, you can use the flat side down, which is more stable. When you get too good for that, you flip it over and you use the round side down. You do the same exercises there. They have re a really good manual on there too. Uh, physio balls, the one big, big balls you sit on, perfect for core stabilization and you can do all kinds of push-ups and things like that on there. Those I would look on the web to get, exer to get samples of exercises. Um, now the web, I, can we get on, we can't go on to a link here, can we? This site, exrx.net, is my all-time favorite and I think it's on the resource sheet too. It's my all-time favorite site from beginners to experts. It has everything. You can go on the beginners page and learn about, learn about exercise physiology, learn about muscles, learn about exercises. You can go on the exercise page and they will show you little videos of how to do each of the exercises. It's phenomenal and it's updated pretty regularly. Um, so that one, especially when you get more involved in it, it also has um, logs, sample logs. So if you want to start keeping track of the exercise you're doing, I think it's a phenomenal site. Apps. Um, smart, everybody have a smartphone? I just got my smartphone a little while ago. I'm loving it, but um, Map My Walk. Anybody heard of it? It's great. I've been using Map My Ride on my computer for a long time. Map My Walk, you, you use it, you're carrying your phone. Your GPS on your phone keeps track of your route keeps track of how many, uh, the distance, how many calories you burned, what the intensity of it was, can tell you to move faster, slower, change your route, whatever. It, that's a great one. And then remember fast exercise with Michael Mosley? Well, this seven minute app is very simple idea. It's phenomenal. What it is is 12 exercises. It takes seven minutes. All you do is it's, the little timer, it says, you ready? Okay, do jumping jacks for 20 seconds, then rest for 10 seconds, then jump, then goes on to the next exercise, 20 seconds, then rest for 10 seconds. It gets the 12 exercises, you're done in seven minutes. This is kind of like his fast exercise program. His is, is a little bit different in that he rides the bike for, I think he goes 20 seconds, then rests for two minutes, 20 seconds, rest for two minutes, 20 seconds, rest for two minutes, and his is, is that seven minutes or something like that? And that's, and it's called high intensity interval training. He does that three times a week and he says that's all he has, that he needs to do to stay fit. Who can't spare seven minutes in a day? That's, it's phenomenal. Um, you've seen all these guys in the stores. They range in price from maybe $50 to $200. They're combining both keeping track like a pedometer would and kind of acting as your own personal trainer, telling you, yeah, you reached your goal, or no, you didn't, you gotta go harder. Um, the things you wanna look at on these is, if you wanna keep track on your computer, some of them sync better than others, so you're gonna have to read up on them a little bit. Uh, this PC Magazine in March had a review of them that was really good. It had a review of about 20 or 30 of those things. So if you can get a hold of that, it's helpful. Um, oh, if we could go online, I guess we can't go online, but these two sites, if you go online, they have tabs to keep track of your food and then tabs to keep track of your activity. My Fitness Pal, they have hundreds of activities listed there. I just shut it off, sorry. No, sorry. Um, hundreds of activities there. They have everything from house cleaning to vacuuming to, um, to curling. They have everything on there. And it, you just put in your weight and the number of minutes you exercised and it gives you an approximate amount of calories that you burned. Um, same thing, Lose It is a much fancier site, but same idea. And, okay, conclusion. Do those sites charge? No, the websites don't. The two apps are free that I mentioned. Um, I should mention one other app, which is fun, but it's called, how do they word it? Um, Achieve Mint, and it's spelled M-I-N-T at the end. What that does is 
you log your activity or, or healthy recipes into that site, and every 25,000 points, they give you points, every 25,000 points, they send you a Visa <coughs> gift card for 25 bucks. It's like you're working for them. That's all you have to do. Um, okay, so in conclusion, I have five challenges for you guys. Try to burn 500 calories a day for seven days, and that will help you lose one pound. That's 35 calories is equal to one pound. Okay, if you can do that, if you can burn 500 calories in a day, which is very tough to do, seven days a week, you'll drop a pound a week. Next one, involve your doctor. Just last year, the World Health Organization classified obesity as a disease. It's now, there is an ICD code now. Your doctor can code anything. So your insurance company will pay for these things because there is an ICD code. Involve your doctor. If you want to know your blood glucose level, you're going to have to ask your doctor for it. Some of these things that we, these targets are not easy to find, but they're important targets, way more important than what your actual weight is. Again, don't exercise to lose weight. Exercise to stay healthy and have fun. Okay? Any? Yes? Okay. How does somebody like me access somebody like you? How does somebody like you? Individualized exercises, let's say. How do, you, how do you start or how do you? How do act? I mean, do people like you exist that people like me can call up and get your services? individualized exercises? Um, there are a couple ways. Yes, there, uh, trainers, most trainers have some exercise physiology background. So that's one place to start. The American Council on Exercise, you can start there and they will direct you to trainers in the area that are trained. American Council of Exercise, ACE. And the other thing is I would start with your doctor. Definitely start with your doctor because even even an exercise physiologist or a trainer, they're going to ask you for that, to have clearance from your physician before they do anything. Okay. All right. Any questions? So Allie can go before she has the baby. Yes. Sorry, Allie. <laughs> All right. So, like Elizabeth said, my name's Allie. I'm one of the dietitians. I work here in the hospital. Um, I do inpatient and outpatient counseling, and both Elizabeth and I work with the bariatric program here as well. Um, so achieving weight loss, we can do it through diet and exercise. Um, at Milford, we also are starting a meal replacement program, and we have our weight loss surgery program. So tonight we're going to just focus on the diet and exercise. So, pretty simple, take in less calories than you use, then you're going to lose weight. Um, so we obviously want, you know, more of the energy and expenditure, less of the food intake. Um, so it all comes down to the calories. So Elizabeth was saying burn the 500 calories a day, or you could eat 500 less calories a day. Over the span of a week, you're going to lose a pound, so that's that 3,500 calories to lose one pound. So you can do a combination, you can do it through diet, you can do it through exercise. Um, but it's all going to come down to the calories. So a lot of diets out there, they focus on, you know, low carbohydrate, low fat, high protein, whatever. There's a diet for anything. Um, but as long as you're restricting your calories, you're going to lose the weight. So I wouldn't push any one of these diets over another because you certainly need a balance of all the nutrients. Um, but if you find something works for you, then you can do it that way. But ideally, we want to be looking more for like a lifestyle change and something that you could sustain over a long period of time. So if you think you can go low carbohydrate for the rest of your life and it's working for you, then go right ahead. That's going to work as long as you're restricting your calories. Um, so some tips on how we can cut back that 500 calories. It may seem like a lot, but it really isn't that many if we um, broke it down over the entire day. So we want to limit um, our intake of high calorie foods. We could swap out high calorie foods for lower calorie options. We certainly want to look at our portion sizes and 
almost everyone could probably decrease their portion sizes. And then we want to practice mindful eating habits. Uh, so if we look at the first one, limiting high calorie foods. We get a lot of empty calories, calories that aren't really doing anything for us nutritionally in a lot of the drinks that we have. So for drinking soda or sugar sweetened beverages, those are essentially empty calories. Um, and those are gonna add up. So just cutting out soda, you know, you can save yourself 200. I mean, it depends on how many you drink in a day, but some people up to 500 right there if you cut soda from your diet. Um, so thinking about what you drink during the day and those calories count as well. Also, beverages like coffee drinks, you know, anything swirl or mocha this, you know, those are all extra calories too. So think about those and maybe you could limit how much you have of those and that's gonna cut back on your calories. Our sweets, you know, maybe afternoon you need that little chocolate fix. Well, there's a lot of calories there too, so those are gonna add up. So thinking about all those little picking at this, picking at that, everything's gonna add up. If we have dessert every night, you know, those are gonna add up as well. And then fat, so if we compared fat to carbohydrate or protein, um, gram for gram it has more calories. So ideally looking for things that are lower in fat are gonna be lower in calories. Um, and we especially wanna make sure we're getting things with less saturated fat and trans fat, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, so if we look at the next idea, which was making a swap, maybe we could swap out some of our high fat foods for lower fat options. So um, those of us drinking milk or getting dairy, which should be everyone, we need, certainly need to get calcium in our diet. Swapping whole milk or 2% milk for a, you know, at least a 1%, if not skim. And um, so it has less fat, so it's gonna have less calories. Everything else is gonna be the same. It's still gonna have the same amount of protein and it's still gonna have the same amount of calcium. But you're gonna save yourself the calories. Um, when it comes to our protein sources, we wanna make sure we're choosing lean proteins. So again, something like a steak, it's very high in fat, is gonna have more calories than uh, a lean piece of chicken or a piece of fish. You're still gonna get the same amount of grams of protein, uh, but the fat's gonna be different, so less calories. And then if we think of the way we're cooking, um, instead of cooking everything in butter or oil, maybe just spray the pan with cooking spray. There's not gonna be any calories there. Or if we change how we cook it, so deep frying is obviously gonna add more fat and calories than if we baked something. So considering those options as well. Um, so that brings us to portion sizes. So, I listed up there kind of the average portion size for the basic food group. So fruits and vegetables about the size of your fist. So a lot of our fruits and vegetables are now almost on steroids. You can get an orange that's like this big. So, you know, it's really only this size. So I have a question yeah. about portion control. Um, like even with Weight Watchers, they say all your fruits and vegetables are free points. Okay. So you couldn't have a huge, big salad or, or you know, with cut up fruits. I mean, it'd be bigger than the size of your fish. Yeah, it would. So there's nothing wrong with having that. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, you're counting points, so that's one thing. But if we're thinking calories, right. well, a f piece of fruit this size is going to have 60 calories. When it's bigger like this, it's closer to like 120 calories. So you can have more than one serving of it, but you just have to account for it. Um, protein, three ounce portion is about the size of a deck of cards or it's the palm of your hand. So the in, just the inside of your hand, not your whole hand. Um, starch and grains or snacks, so like crackers or something, it's about a cup to handful is one serving or a half cup, to, half cup if it's cooked, so rice or pasta, which is not very much. Um, and cheese, a pair of dice, is one serving. <laughs> so, like I wrote at the bottom, you can have more than one serving. Just, you know, you're only kidding yourself if you think you're only having one serving of cheese and you have half the brick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I 
I dieted my whole life, and I've always seen that, you know, palm of your hand deck of cards thing. Well, today, you can get a quarter pounder. Well, yeah, that'll fit in the palm of your hand when it's three inches thick. Right, yeah. You know? Or like a piece of beef or something. You know? Yeah, it doesn't really count if you pile it up either. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, I mean, you're only cheating yourself, so. The, the, the pair of dice is what's got me strong for a loop. I mean, I, I think I've seen everything else a million times in my life, but yeah. a pair of dice, when you think about a cream cheese, there's more than a pair of dice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, string cheese is a good snack, you know, because at least it's, you know, it's in the package itself, and hopefully you just limit yourself to one. Whereas if you're cutting cheese off a brick, you know, you can cut and cut again and cut again and again and again. Right. Yeah. Yep. So you noticed on the cabbage cheese bricks, mm -hmm. they actually have, right on the side, it measures one ounce. So I just noticed that I didn't even eat cheese by half a brick in a survey. Yeah. But they actually have measured out by ounce. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there are a lot of nut containers do that as well. They'll have the one ounces marked on the side so you can see because nuts are another thing we can often eat too much of. Um, so when it comes to getting the right portion size, we, we want to make sure we're measuring it out. So, you know, things like pasta, cereal, put what you would on your plate, then measure it and see how close you are to a serving size. Just to check. If you're more, then you know you, do, you have to account for those calories. If you're right on, then good job. Um, sometimes if you just measure your cereal and put it in the bowl, you get used to where it comes on your bowls at home, and then you don't have to do it every single day because it can be, obviously it's going to take a lot of time to measure out everything you eat, but you're going to be better for it. Um, we want to make sure we're looking at how much we're cooking and how many people are actually eating the meal. So if you're cooking for six and there's only two of you there, you know, what's going to stop you from having three servings if you finish everything? So that's good to keep in mind. What works at my house, because I just cook for myself and my husband right now, you know, when I get home from the grocery store, I try to portion things out and then freeze them. So I don't have to cook all the chicken that I just bought. I'm just going to cook one chicken breast because that's enough for the two of us. So trying to do little things like that, that makes it easier. Um, dining away from home, portions are pretty much out of control. So, you know, you could try splitting a meal. You could get an appetizer for a meal. You could ask for a takeout container right when you sit down. You could kind of visually draw a line on your plate, not let yourself go over it. Um, but most meals at restaurants could be close to three or four portions, especially pasta dishes. Um, so you definitely want to keep that in mind. And then plate size. So what we're eating off of, that can have a factor too. So there's a little image there. Which plate do you think has more food? Same, but it looks really good on the left, right? And on the right, mm, you probably want to put a little bit more on your plate. So if you start with a smaller plate, closer to a nine inch size, like most people's salad plates now, um, you can really fill it up. And visually, it looks like you're eating more. Whereas you have your dinner plates, which are mm, probably like 12 inches now. If you fill it up, you're probably getting too much. If you do like that, maybe it's not as visually satisfying. Um, and then our final concept is practice mindful eating. So this is a, kind of a new concept. We talk about it a lot with our um, weight loss program, but it's good for everyone. It's just the idea that we want to start enjoying our food and thinking about what we're eating instead of just sitting there shoveling it in and you know, not even taking a moment to breathe or have a conversation with the person we're eating with. So we want to make sure we're using our senses and taste the food and smell the food. We want to stop when we're full, and we want to, you know, eat because we're hungry. So it takes 20 minutes for our brain to know that we're full. So if you eat three plates in 20 minutes, you know, you're not really helping yourself. But if you slow down and put your fork down, take a sip of your water, talk to the person you're eating with, you know, 20 minutes might go by and be like, oh, I'm full. I didn't finish everything, but you know what? I'm full. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to those cues. 
Uh, we also want to identify triggers for mindless eating. So <coughs> most everyone does at least a little bit of mindless eating. So this is when you're just, you know, standing in front of the refrigerator eating the leftovers. You're not even hungry. You just don't know what to do. Or um, you get home from work and you're bored, so you just go right to the pantry. All those are. May I have your attention, please? It's now 8 p.m. and all visitors are requested to leave the hospital. Thank you. Um, so all those are mindless eating habits. Or. Um, a lot of us eat for emotional reasons. So trying to think of why you're eating um, and stopping yourself. Maybe you just need to distract yourself. A lot of times after dinner, we do a lot of mindless eating in front of the television. So give, make yourself sit there for 10 minutes. Tell yourself, am I really hungry after the 10 minutes? Nope. Maybe you distracted yourself with something else. Maybe you're knitting or maybe you're... Um, playing cards, I don't know, what you, whatever you want to do. Um, but give yourself that 10 minutes to really ask yourself if you need to get up and have something to eat. Most likely it's mindless eating and it's a habit that we want to try to break. Uh, and then remember, you are not a garbage disposal. You don't have to finish everything in front of you. You don't have to eat something. It's okay to you know, have leftovers or throw it away. Um, this is like really big with my mom. It's like her favorite thing. So you're better than that. You're not a garbage disposal. So those are some ways to help cut out those 500 calories a day that can help with weight loss. And then I wanted to include some things that, you know, maybe we want to focus on getting in our diet that are also going to help with weight loss. So setting a goal to have three meals and two to three snacks a day. If you're not doing that now, you know, that's something that maybe you could start doing. For a lot of people, we often skip breakfast. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. We want to get our metabolism going, so we have to eat to get it going. You've spent the whole night sleeping. You know, you're not helping yourself burn any calories. You start eating. We're going to start burning some calories. Um, so starting with breakfast, even if it's small, something is better than nothing. And then we don't want to skip any meals. So making sure we have those, you know, a snack three to four hours later, meal, snack, meal, and so forth. Um, when we skip meals, we, you know, our, our bodies hold on to calories because we go into a starvation mode. Also, we often tend to overeat at the next meal because we're starving. Um, or we'll just graze and pick on stuff in between meals. So trying to get yourself into more of a structure, three meals and two to three snacks a day can help with weight loss. Uh, we want to remember that food is health, so we're eating because our bodies need the nutrients and we want to be healthy. So diets can have an effect on our energy levels. When we're eating stuff that's, you know, all fat and fast food and real junk, you know, we often feel sluggish and we have no energy. When we're eating things that are more natural, you know, our bodies like that, we automatically are going to start to feel a little bit more alive and awake and have the energy to get through the day pretty much. You know, when we have things that are just really carb heavy, yeah, I think I need a nap, you know. Whereas if you get a good balance, that's giving you the energy to get through the day. So we want to make sure we're getting a balance of fiber, protein, and fat at each meal. Those are, that's what's going to help us stay full. And there's a little cartoon there. <laughs> so the first thing was fiber. So we want to make sure we're getting that at each meal if we could. So think fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans. Fiber helps regular, regulate our digestion, can lower cholesterol, helps regulate blood sugar. Um, and then just a little information on the soluble versus insoluble. So you want to get both. They both are, have their health benefits. Um, so getting a good combination of those fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans. The next was protein. So think poultry, fish, beans, beef, eggs, nuts, seed, dairy, soy. And when possible, we want to choose the lean because that's going to have um, less fat, so lower calories. And remove any visible fat. So taking the skin off the chicken, um, cutting off any white meat, white fat we see on the beef before cooking. Um, and we want to make sure we're getting protein with each meal and snack, just like the fiber. And the third thing was the fat. So fat helps us feel full as well. So we don't, 
we don't want to cut fat out of our diet. A fat-free diet isn't going to help us out. We need fat to absorb a lot of our vitamins. Um, it's going to help us feel full. We just want to make sure we're choosing the healthy fats over the unhealthy fats. Yeah. What about coconut oil? It used to be, you know, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. But now, oh, coconut oil is wonderful. What mm -hmm. is your view on coconut oil? I still say no, no, no. Mm -hmm. So they, they've only done a little bit of research and it's really not supporting, um, there's just not enough evidence there yet. So coconut oil is something like 93% saturated fat, um, but they think it might have some health benefits, but there really isn't enough research there yet. So you can do it if you want, but I wouldn't no, push it. <laughs> um, if we're thinking oils, we want to choose more like the olive oil, canola oils. Um, and besides the oils, we want nuts, seeds, avocado, some fatty fish. Those are all going to be the healthy fats, the monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated fats. Um, so the majority of our fats should be coming from those sources. Excuse me, so mm -hmm. um, margarine in a tub mm -hmm. that's not really solid, is that better than stick margarine or butter? Or yeah. Is it the same? No, so margarine in the tub is better. Oh. Stick margarine is, um, is a trans fat. We never want to have stick margarine. Um, so the unhealthy fats are the saturated and the trans fats. So think of more of the solid ones like the butter, shortening, which um, we don't see too often, um, the milk fat, beef fat, and stick margarine. So the saturated fats, that's what raises cholesterol. The trans fats, that's what raises our bad cholesterol and lowers our good cholesterol. So we definitely want to be getting very few of those and no trans fats. If you want to have that for breakfast? Yeah, you could do that for breakfast. She wanted to ask about having like a protein shake for her breakfast meal. I said, Did I already do it? No, okay. Um, so it all comes down to making a plan. You want to, you know what you're doing before the day comes and you're not caught off guard. So for some people, maybe just planning out the, the next day before you go to bed, you know, make sure you, you know what you're going to have for breakfast, lunch, dinner. Some people can plan out the whole week. That's how I food shop. I plan out the whole week. So if you have a plan, you're more apt to stick with it. You won't be, you know, driving off for takeout or um, picking up fast food on the way home because you already know what you're doing when you get there. Um, and with your plan, you got a food shop. So it's, you can't just say I'm having chicken tonight if you don't have it in the house. So you got to make the effort to go food shopping and have all these healthy items around. So making a list and sticking with it when you get to the grocery store, trying not to be tempted by items on the ends. Um, shopping around the outside of the grocery store with more of the natural foods are instead of the processed stuff that's in the middle. Um, that's a great way, great tip. Packing snacks to have on hand so if you know you're going to be out for a long period of time, you know, having a single serving of nuts or a granola bar or something in your purse so you can reach for that instead of stopping at a convenience store. And bringing lunch to work instead of buying um, unless you're at a place that, you know, has some great healthy options like our cafeteria. Um, but you're more likely going to be better off bringing your lunch with you. You know what's in it. Um, you can stick to your serving. You won't be tempted to, you know, pick up the pizza because you already have, like, your salad or sandwich packed with you. If you want to make your own protein shake for breakfast, mm -hmm. are we talking about the stuff you throw the protein powder in, or can you just, like, throw... Milk and then put bananas, whatever you want to put in it. Peanut yeah. butter. Yeah. 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 I mean, you put could. Chocolate in there. <laughs> <laughs> you could do either. You can make your own smoothie with, you know, like yogurt, milk, and frozen fruit. Some people like the protein powder. You could do something like that. You could do like a carnation instant breakfast. Um, that made with skim milk. Better than skipping breakfast. Mm -hmm. I have one question on <coughs> packing lunches. 
Yeah. Brown bagging lunches and when you're shopping in the supermarket. Yeah. Pertaining to microwavable, which we would also, it would come under process, you know. Mm -hmm. Microwavable, say, Weight Watchers lunches. Okay. Portion control. Mm -hmm. Calories are counted. Now, I mean, how bad would it be to do that, like, say, five days a week because you need a quick fix for a 30 minute lunch break while you're at work. Yeah. You know, do you think that's bad? Um, I mean, there's, it's not bad. It's good. You know, like you said, it's portion controlled. Um, you usually get a good variety. You know, the only negatives I would say, you know, you might not be getting all natural sources of food. Right. You know, they might not be making stuff with whole grains and they're often high in sodium. Mm, so. Okay, so what do you think is an acceptable sodium? Do you have? Because I do read grams on the back of the packages. I do, honestly. Okay. And I'm confused about what's really okay for a daily sodium intake level mm -hmm. for you know all the adults that are trying to lose <laughs> What what are we supposed to look at as a target? So the new recommendations are 1,500 milligrams or less if you have history of um, any heart history. For any other person, it's, you know, keeping it under 2,000. Under two. Yeah. Okay. The food label, they base it off of 2,300. So the percent daily value would be based off of 2,300 milligrams. And if you don't put salt on anything? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> you don't want to, but, you know, something like a frozen meal, it could have six, 700 milligrams. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Elizabeth was talking about your BMR, so um, basically what your body needs to get through the day is your calorie need, and then you would multiply it by your activity level, so everyone's going to be different. Um, there's calculators online, that Mifflin equation, which takes into account your age, your height, your weight, um, and then you would factor in your activity level. That would give you your calories if you wanted to stay just where you are. That's how many calories your body needs. Mm -hmm. If you subtract that 500, that would set you up for weight loss of one pound per week. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question, maybe not related, but there's been a lot of controversy about, I know not to drink sugary soda, mm -hmm. but diet, even diet soda, uh, I drink a lot of the things diet, like tea, iced tea, or uh, maybe one, or is the reason that they don't want you to have too much of that diet soda to get away from tasting sweet stuff, or is there really a reason not to drink those diet drinks? Um, yeah, I mean, that's one theory that if you're getting that sweet, you're going to be craving other sweets, and then you'll be more apt to pick something else to fulfill that craving. But, you know, scientifically, there's no evidence that those artificial sweeteners are causing any cancer or doing any harm. But, you know, there's always ongoing research. But if you're someone that drinks a lot and you would be getting soda instead, you know, you're helping yourself out by choosing a diet. Water, ideally, is going to be the best choice. It's a gas effect with drinking too much soda, too, even diet soda. Um, and also, there's a, um, like, to sweeten up, say that we're under control with sweeteners. Like, stevia, is that considered a more, better, non-chemical alternative? Um, so I'm not going to say one's better than the other because that one's new, so they just haven't done enough research on it yet, but <coughs> it's kind of your choice. If you think you could do without it, then that's what I would tell you to do. There's really no chemical um, or physiological reason not to drink too much diet stuff. Not that they found yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I understand that I eat way too many calories in nuts and peanut butter. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, and I hate to admit this, 
I stand with the spoon in the peanut butter jar, mm -hmm. but then it fills me up and I don't eat dinner. Now, of course, that's t terrible for you, but I justify it in my mind by saying I'm getting all that protein. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've just eaten 800 calories in peanut butter on a spoon. Mm -hmm. So what, what can you do to help me here? Because <laughs> I buy, I, I'll eat a can of nuts, and I, in my mind, it's like, well, I'm getting that, what I need from the nuts. I'm, they're, they're nutritious. The can says so. Yeah. What, what, what can I do? do I, give me a suggestion. How can I break that nasty nut habit? Well, yeah, so you're right. They're not bad choices. Um, good, healthy fats, and they help you feel full and satisfied. But you're basically just mindlessly eating. So, you know, you need to take out a serving, put the rest away, and walk away. Oh, you can't okay. be in that kitchen standing yes. there. <laughs> All right, so in other words, I have to put put away the serving spoon size and take out a teaspoon size. Put some on a plate. <laughs> put it on a plate, okay, thank you. With your apple, and then go sit down. <laughs> okay, so let's just move on and make sure we get through this. So we want to make sure we're getting a balance at every meal. So if we look at the plate, we want a quarter of our plate to be our protein, a quarter of our plate to be our starch, and half our plate to be full of vegetables. You know, this might not be true at breakfast. You probably, you know, would swap out that vegetables for maybe a piece of fruit. Lunch, you could probably have a fruit and a vegetable. Um, but the other stuff should stay the same. And definitely at dinner, trying to aim for a half plate of vegetables. Um, so why do we want those? You can get huge volume for very few calories. So it's going to help fill up your stomach, and it's not really going to cost you too much, so long as you're not covering them with cheese or um, anything too fatty. <laughs> if you check out the Choose by Plate Gov website, they have some ideas for balanced meals. Um, they have a lot of great info on there. There's, they're the ones that came up with the My Plate image. So the My Plate is what replaced the My Pyramid. Um, so then keeping track, you know, we want to Keep a food log, ideally, writing down things that you ate during the day. It helps you identify habits, you know, identify that habit of I stand in front of the peanut butter and I eat half a jar, or, you know, it can help hold you accountable if you have to write all that down. Maybe the next day, say, shoot, I really shouldn't have done that. Um, but basically, you know, I see it with all my patients, and the research has supported it, too. Those that keep track are those that lose weight. So whether you want to do it just writing it down every day, whether you want to do it on the computer, um, or you can use it, do it right on your phone or an iPad with those apps. So the MyFitnessPal app that Elizabeth was talking about and the Lose It, Lose it app, those are my favorite as well. So you can log your intake and your exercise. Um, and if you put your information into there, they can give you a calorie goal too. Um, and they're free. There's also Spark People. There's also tons of free apps that will help you. Um, keep track. So those are good. It's tedious, but it, you'll see the benefits. Uh, so how do we stay focused and now maintain all this weight that we've lost? So research, research has shown that those people that limit how often they go out to eat, they're going to be successful with keeping the weight off. So setting a goal to eat out less than three times per week, you know, less better. Um, Restaurant eating usually equals those large portions we were talking about and lots of added fat, sugar, salt, anything to make the food taste better, they're going to put it in there. Um, eating similar foods every day, you know, you don't have to eat the same thing every day, but find a few things that work for you and work with your calorie goal um, and give you a good balance and mixing those up and sticking with something similar most days, those people tend to be successful with keeping weight off. Not splurging on holidays and special occasions. Um, so I hear this all the time. It was the holidays. Well, Christmas is one day. Doesn't mean that you can eat <laughs> cookies for three weeks around the holidays. So keeping it to that one day and let yourself have whatever you want, you know, that's going to be better than baking a batch of cookies and eating four every day just because it's the holidays. Um, so keeping that in mind. Weighing yourself, so again, research has shown that people that weigh themselves at least once a week tend to keep the weight off and stay on track. So getting a scale and, um, you know, setting a routine. 
ideally the same day each week, and then you can see your progress. And then uh, limiting screen time. So trying to get less than 10 hours per week is a good goal. Um, think about how much you do outside of your job now and see if you can cut that back. Think of stuff that you can do instead, you know, go for a walk after dinner instead of sitting down on the couch, um, help the kids with homework, um, knit something, read a book, whatever. Think of an activity you can do instead of screen time. If it's physically active, all the better. Um, and set small changes. You know, cutting out a half hour every week. You know, not going from their 40 hours of TV watching down to 10, but maybe make small steps towards your goal. There's a little quote there from Mark Twain. A habit is habit. Not to be flung out the window, but coaxed downstairs a step at a time. So habits take a long time to break. And then how do we measure our success? So a goal of about one to two pounds of weight loss a week is perfect. More than that, we often gain it back. So a lot of crash diets, you know, promise to lose 10 pounds overnight. Well, you're probably going to gain it all back. So we really are focusing on making lifestyle changes, changing the way you're eating and being more physically active. You can set yourself up for positive results, losing one to two pounds a week and keeping it off. Um, and the latest research has shown that, you know, even losing 5 to 10% of your current body weight is going to be associated with positive health benefits, um, even closer to 3%. So any weight loss is going to be good weight loss. The more you lose, the better the results are going to be, and keeping it off is going to be the best thing for you. Um, so any other questions? Oh, and I included up there, that's our um, appointment line, so if you wanted to sit down with uh, myself or one of the other dietitians one-on-one, -on -one. that's the number that you would call. Our secretary will help you get a referral through your doctor. Um, if you want information on the weight loss surgery, you can call that number as well. And then can you, sorry, I'm sorry. And then can you talk about um, water? I was listening at work and there were a couple guys talking about how you should drink like, um, I don't know, he, his figure was like 100 ounces of water because he weighs like 200 pounds. And I'm like, 100 ounces a day? I'd be in the bathroom the entire day. <laughs> so, you know, how can you do that? And like, can you relate it to, like, I, I love having, you know, a coffee. So can is that part of the water or should I not count that? And then my third question is, should there be like, I'm not, like, I know I should be eating breakfast, but I'm just not into it at 7 o'clock in the morning when I'm heading out the door. So how do I counteract that if I'm just not used to it? I don't like anything cold, really, you know? Like, I mean, I'd love a peanut butter toast, you know, but I'm just not into breakfast. And, and also, like, how, how much time should be between meals, you know? If four questions. Okay, four <laughs> questions, sorry. <laughs> Um, so the first one, the time thing, so um, I feel like Oprah was the one that kind of spearheaded that, like she stops eating after 6 o'clock or something like that. Um, but the time doesn't really matter, it's how much you eat. So for most people, that eating after 7 o'clock is usually the eating they do in front of the television, which is the mindless eating, and you're eating out of a bag of chips or a box of crackers, and before you know it, you've eaten half a box. So. <coughs> setting a rule for yourself that I don't eat after 7 o'clock, it's just kind of to help you get rid of that. But if you get home late and you don't eat dinner until 7.30, it doesn't mean that all those calories that you ate at 7.30 are immediately stored as fat. Because it's all the calories you have in over the entire day. Um, so it's kind of whatever works for you. If you have to set a rule for yourself because you know that you graze after dinner, then maybe that's what you want to do. But it, it's not going to have that effect. Um, the water, about 64 ounces is good. So eight, eight ounce glasses. Um, calorie free. Like it's not that much. So it's only like four of those Poland spring bottles. Do you consider that? Yeah, you could count that calorie free. Yeah. Um, and milk. 
coffee, you know, there's some controversy because maybe the caffeine is dehydrating, so then it's not really having the same effect. But, you know, if you're decaf or, you know, you can count as some of your fluid. But trying to get, like, I have a cup with me all day, so I just kind of sip at it while it's at my desk. And before you know it, you're, you're up to, like, 40 ounces. And that's not even counting what you have with your meals. Your third question was? Oh, just any kind of, like, placement of meals, you know? Oh, the breakfast. Yeah. Um, eating, yeah. Should there be a certain amount of time between meals? Yeah, so back to your peanut butter and toast, that's pretty much what I have every single morning for breakfast. Um, it's a great breakfast. You know, you're getting some protein, you're getting some fat, and you're getting, if you put it on some whole grain bread, some um, fiber right there. So, you know, no, it's actually pretty good. Have a piece of fruit with it. Um, and, you know, we want to eat about every three to four hours to keep our metabolism going. Mm -hmm. Plain tea or plain coffee? Yeah. Uh, would that count in your daily intake of uh, fluids? Yeah, so same thing. If it's if it's caffeinated, you know, do, there's a little I usually do decaf of everything. Yep, yeah, so that's pretty much just yeah, water. So that you can include that. Yeah. And also, like, you have the um, lemonade or, or uh, that has no calories or any one of those. Like a crystal light kind of thing? Like a crystal light yeah. type thing. Yeah, that's. You can count that in also. That's your As calories. long as it has no sugars or calories. Right. Okay. Great. I have a question about dairy. What, what do you recommend you, for. Did you use the mic? Sorry. What do you recommend regarding dairy? Like, for instance, is one non fat yogurt a day? acceptable or should you know should we replace it with you know another dairy option or so you know, what do you, what we're do you getting recommend? dairy to meet our calcium needs so if we're um, under 50 it's about a thousand milligrams if we're 51 or over, over it's 1200 milligrams per day so yogurt is one way to get it milk low-fat cheese if you're not reaching that our bodies take it from our bones so we certainly want to make sure we're getting enough and maybe if you're not getting on a calcium supplement instead. Always choosing low fat. Yep. What, what, I've been hearing a lot about Sorry, wheat lately, that wheat is not as good as it used to be for us, the way they are processing. Mm -hmm. it, is that true? Sorry. Did, you, did everybody get it? <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing a lot about wheat. I'm reading the book Wheat Belly. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. Is it true that wheat is not as good for us as it used to be years ago and we shouldn't be eating a lot of it or maybe none of it? Um, so I wouldn't say cut wheat out of our diets. You know, that's a great way to get our fiber that we want. Um, that would kind of go along the idea of a low carb diet. So if you're trying to do it for weight loss, it's going to cut calories if you cut it out. Um, it's kind of whatever works for you. I couldn't live without bread, so I'm not going to cut it for my diet, but I always choose the whole grain because that's the less processed, okay. the one you're going to get the most nutrients from and the fiber from. So you can read a lot online, but... Okay. <laughs> I have a problem that I don't wake up hungry, and sometimes I need to go somewhere, so I need some. What can I eat? Because I have to run out the door. Today I ate lunch out, and it was time to come here, and I'm thinking, what am I going to eat? I need, I'm not hungry, but I need to eat something so I won't be hungry. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest for something like that? That's a real dilemma for me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you eat when you're really not hungry, but you have to leave the building? <laughs> well, I mean, you got to eat something you like. I mean, toast is my latest thing for breakfast, but, okay. but I, I just am at a loss. What's a good choice for a quick something to stick with you? So for breakfast or Any, for... Breakfast, anything, any meal. If you've got a suggestion, I'd love it. Um, <laughs> any meal that's going to give you a good balance of um, some fiber, some protein, and some fat. You know, when we get in the habit of eating more regularly every three to four hours, three meals, two snacks, you find that you will wake up hungry and your body... Well, your body will start burning calories and your metabolism's working, so it happens for most people. Um, having snacks on hand, nuts, granola bars, yogurt, fruit, 
I don't know what you like. <laughs> I have a similar dilemma like that. I'm not hungry when I wake up. Mm-hmm. And about maybe I'm a, uh, I have my, my um, circadian clock or whatever they call it has always been that I'm more um, b clearer in later in the afternoon than in the morning. I can function, but my better functioning time is later in the afternoon and at night. So I wake up. What I've been finding is I'm re reversing and having something like breakfast tea at night. So you, you, but you say that if you go from one clock hour to 24 hours, that's what you consider your day's meal. Right, how many calories you take in over the day. Because sometimes I'll start my day of eating at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And instead of having a breakfast, I might have a salad with chicken in it or something. Okay, so if you can work to break that habit, it's going to be better off because your body is just not doing you any, you're not burning anything until you start eat, eating. You okay. get your metabolism working. So you really meta your metabolism isn't really functioning up until... It slows down, so, but things to help speed it up or eating more regularly, exercising and building more muscle, those are things that can help speed up your metabolism. If it's a butter, you know. It, it says butter, but it's a soft, and it's like Smart Balance and all the other new ones that they have out. So if it's a butter, and it ha it's going to have saturated fat, so just trying to use less of it. If it's a tub margarine, usually, yeah. it usually has more water yeah. and not as much, so. So as long as there's less saturated fat in it, it's okay to use it. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Whipped butter? I would, I would read the nutrition facts label and see how much saturated fat okay. is in it. Yeah. Um, if you if you wanted an omelet, let's say, or some eggs, mm -hmm. are you gonna go Excuse for me. the egg whites, or are you gonna go for regular eggs, or what what do you think is more nutritionally sound? What is new egg whites versus? So the it really real depends deal. on your <laughs> personal um, past medical history. Do you have high cholesterol? Do you have heart health issues? Well, let's say I'm on a pill to control cholesterol as well as my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And I might want to eat eggs once a week. That's fine. So do I go for egg whites? You could have either. Or scrambled eggs, real scrambled eggs? You could have either. Either Whichever would be okay. Okay, thank you.